Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the country series on Russia. The last video we looked at was the Decemberist Revolt, where a group of army officers tried to overthrow the Tsar in 1825. While they had grand and liberal and very progressive ideas for the time, ultimately the revolt was a failure and Russia doubled down on its repression at this point. And so now we're looking at the Russian Revolution of 1917 by Oversimplified. And this is an event that I know more about than anything else we've covered in the Russia series so far. Pretty much everything pre the Russian Revolution was all new for me, so I've been happy to do this country series with you guys and, uh, and learn a ton, learn a ton about the country. So hopefully now at this point, there are some points where I can pause the video and maybe give a little bit more information as I usually like to do, um, because I'm not just sitting here being like, I have no idea, <laughs> right? Because everything's new for me. If you haven't already yet, go check out the other Russia videos. I've done the history of Russia, um, the origins of authoritarianism, shopping in the Soviet Union, all sorts of other stuff. I'll leave a playlist in the top right here if you want to go check it out. And if you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. It all helps the channel. And if you're interested in more exclusive videos or want me to react to super obscure topics, go join the Patreon where you'll be able to suggest videos and I will make them for you. So without further ado, let's get into Oversimplified, the Russian Revolution. Hey Jimmy, it's the 1800s, an exciting time to be alive. Why don't you get out there and explore the world? Gee whiz, Mom, thanks. This place is amazing. Where am I? Why, you're in France, my boy. Here we come up with wacky new ways of running a country. Liberty, egality, fraternity. Yep. Whoa, welcome to the United Kingdom. Here we invented the train. Hello, aboard. Holy smokes! You're in a German factory, my friend. Here we harness <laughs> fire and coal to create all these sexy lederhosen. So it says here, lederhosen on machine nicht erlaubt. So you're not allowed to put um, lederhosen on the machines. This is incredible. I can't wait to see where I'll end up next. Oh. Where am I? <laughs> you're in Russia. Have I gone back in time? No, this is just how it is. Are you a farmer? Worse. Technically, my landlord owns me, which makes me a serf. I'm scared. Yeah. Um, so serfdom at this point was basically Russia's feudalist system that went on far longer than anything else, uh, than any other country in, Ger in Germany. Ugh. Then in Europe, for example, in Germany or in Prussia at the time, I think it was ball abolished in maybe 1807, 1810 or something like this. But serfdom was not abolished until 1861 in Russia. And I'm sure that Oversimplified will get into that, so I won't give too many details. But yeah, Russia at this point was very much behind the rest of Europe um, economically um, with, with liberal ideas as well. Um, and so, yeah, the system of serfdom was obviously not a very pleasant one for a lot of the people that have to live under it. The majority of of people living in Russia were serfs. And this led to a lot of really sort of horrific living circumstances and, and very poor quality of life, as well as, um, yeah, is there is there really much more to say than that? It was, it was not a very nice system to be a part of. You should be, because I haven't eaten in four days and you look pretty tasty. Hey, Jimmy, how are your travels? <laughs> I hate you! Russia in the 19th century, feudal, underdeveloped, and stuck in the past. While the rest yep. of Europe had been modernizing and improving their citizens' lives, Russia's rulers were taking a different approach. My lord, we're falling behind the rest of Europe. It's time to industrialize, give the people rights, and share your power. Nope. Russian czars <laughs> yeah, had no exactly. time for pathetic ideas like liberty and modernization because they were too busy having the time of their lives. While this Right, and this isn't to say that these liberal ideas did not exist, right? As I said in the intro, the Decembrists were revolt of, of 1825, as well as some other key uh, figures in Russian history that tried to push more liberal ideas. The names are going to totally escape me and I'd mispronounce them anyways, but the history of Russia video I already did, um, go check that one out. It's in the Russia playlist. And it's not that these ideas did not exist. It's just that the opportunities to actually bring them about in the country never happened. And the Tsar, well, again, there was multiple Tsars, but post really Catherine, arguably, the, the, the power structures of the Tsars got even more and more and more repressive. 
serfs were breaking their backs in the fields, the czars held all the power, and they didn't have to listen to anyone. Yep. Want to run the country like a backwards feudal kingdom while the rest of Europe outpaces you militarily and economically? Go right ahead. Want to keep the people uneducated so they don't get any ideas? There's no one to stop you. Want to yep. keep exporting grain even when there's a massive famine causing hundreds of thousands to die? That is your God-given right. While all of this was great for the Tsar, if you were literally anybody else, it probably sucked because Russia was falling behind. If they were to keep up with- Unless you were royalty as well. Europe, they'd need a strong ruler with some big ideas. Oh look, here comes one now. Hey everyone, it's me, Tsar Alexander II, and I've got some big news. I'm releasing you all from your serfdom. You're all free. Yes. Not really yep, though. I'm the best. Oh, there is one thing though. I spoke to your local lords and they weren't happy about losing all their free labor. So as a compromise, you're all gonna have to pay them back a near impossible amount of money for the next 49 years. Expect your lives to barely change. Okay, bye. Now I know what you're thinking. This Tsar Alexander II seems like a pretty cool guy. He's trying to reform the country and get Russia on the right path. Everyone must love this guy, right? Wrong. Why does one man get to decide the fate of everyone in the country? So that's not, it, it's not that he was loathed and absolutely despised like some other, like some other Tsars before or to come, as we'll see. But yes, he was considered the great liberator, right, of the serfdom. However, it was not executed in a way where every single serf actually did benefit, right? This was similar to, I mean, what happened in... In, in the United States when slavery was abolished is that a lot of these former slaves then had to go back and work on those same plantations that they were a slave uh, uh, that they were a slave on because the economic situation because serfdom uprooted so much economically is that um, there weren't as many jobs for these people and they were pretty much still in an indentured servitude right to their to their lords. This whole system is dumb. Somebody should do something. Like what? Like kill the czar. You're gonna kill the czar? Well, me, no. I'm busy. I was kind of hoping you'd do it. Okay. See? The people love me. They're throwing flowers, confetti, and high-grade explosives. Okay, Nicholas. Yep. Your grandfather has a mild case of being blown up by a terrorist, and he's not looking too hot. So we're gonna go say our goodbyes, okay? No, it'll be too scary for him. Nonsense. It won't be scary at all. We're just gonna say a quick goodbye. Ready? Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Look at me! The people did this to me! Oh, God. And one day, they'll do it to you! See? Wasn't scary at all. So Alexander II was dead, but luckily they had another Alexander lying around, Alexander the yep. Third, and he felt his dad's reforms had weakened the Tsar's authority. Exactly. Russia was massive, and as a result, had many ethnic minorities, non-Russians, more interested in their own cultural heritage than in loving me. Isn't it great? So much beautiful culture and diversity in our great nation. Alexander thought all these minorities should be able Exactly. And so while his father was, again, not to all, but was more considered a liberator, he was interested in modernizing Russia. I think oversimplifies, maybe painting a little bit more negative of a picture. But hey, let me know in the comments if you, if you think I'm wrong or if you think oversimplified is wrong. But um, yeah, so he was not interested in these liberal reforms as well. He was more interested in sort of ruling with an iron fist. And he thought that these reforms really, you know, caused anarchy in the country and, and would possibly lead to something that happened uh, in France with the French Revolution just before Louis the, oh God, there's so many Louis 14th, I wanna say, and Marie Antoinette. Little more Russian and thereby loyal to him. So he repressed religious minorities. He repressed non-Russians. He introduced the Okhrana, a secret police force that repressed anybody who thought having a czar was dumb. The if first Alexander time. Alexander II was the a great reformer. Russian Alexander secret III was the great repressor. Yeah. Now that's how you run a country. Hey, Dad? Ugh, great. It's my son, Nicholas, who I like to call a girly girl because he's so weak and pathetic. When are you gonna grow up? <laughs> eh, you still look like a girly girl to me. But Dad, I grew a beard. <laughs> yeah, an ugly girly girl beard. <laughs> if Nicholas was to one day be czar, he needed his dad to teach him how to run the country. But his dad instead suggested that Nicholas go somewhere else. So Nicholas went to Japan, got an edgy dragon tattoo, had his head sliced off by a policeman, and then came mm. home. Now will you teach me? Yeah, so that's why he has, uh, he has a scar on, on the right side of his forehead. Me how to rule. <sighs> I suppose it's time. Okay, there's a lot you need to know before becoming czar. Uh-oh. What? I've got kidney inflammation. Dead. 
Yep. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Upon his father's death, a totally unprepared Nicholas II ascended to the Russian throne. He wasn't a reformer like his grandfather, nor was he a repressor like his dad. Nicholas was Nicholas. Timid, easily swayed, and more interested in doing whatever the hell this is. Or this. Or this. He wasn't ready to rule, and he okay. admitted it, saying, I'm not yet ready to be czar. I know nothing of the business of ruling. <laughs> time to bring it up. However, Nick yeah, and so this is the interesting thing with monarchies too, right? And how it's a system that's really, you know, thankfully has, has gone the way of the dodo, so to say, is that um, if you have a, if you have a hair line if you have a lineage that's ready to be or that has to be crowned king next, and they're not ready, unless they renounce the crown, which then sometimes can lead to a succession crisis, um, you're kind of stuck. Right, you sort of have to, and it's trial by fire for these new tsars, emperors, kings, whatever. And when you have a whole country like Russia, and you're sort of winging it, so to say, and obviously you have the council and everything like this, but you're personally not ready to rule. Yeah, what about those millions of other people that now are ruled by you, right? How are they going to be affected? Nicholas firmly believed that he was chosen by God to be Russia's big daddy. And while he doubted his ability to rule, he was going to give it his best shot. And hey, who knows? Maybe he wouldn't be so bad after all. To get things off to a good start, Nicholas promised ah, free yes. pretzels and beer to a huge crowd in Moscow to celebrate his coronation. So enticing a proposition to starving Nicholas peasants Waldo. that the ensuing stampede left nearly 1,500 people dead. What the hell happened? We're not sure, but you're scheduled to go party with the French at 8 o'clock. Shouldn't I stay here out of respect for the people? When have Russian Tsars ever respected the people? Hmm. <laughs> Nicholas's decision to go party with the French immediately tarnished his image. Some were calling him Nicholas the Bloody. The Tsars had been partying hard at the expense of the people for long enough. They'd emancipated the serfs, but failed to lift them out of poverty. Yep. They used their secret police to crack down on anyone who might criticize them. And they'd failed to modernize and give the people rights, something the rest of Europe had begun doing over a century ago. The rule of the Tsars was quickly becoming outdated, and more and more Russians began wondering if there was a better way. For many, the solution was simple. Just look to the West. Republics, democracies, and constitutional monarchies galore. But a small growing group rejected that for an even better idea, a little something they called communism. Take Vladimir mm -hmm. Lenin, an intelligent member of Russia's middle class, and also a massive ill-tempered jerk. If you disagreed with him about anything, he wasn't afraid to call you out. You fat-headed, simple-minded, vapid, cockeyed imbecile. Tender heart bear is a far superior care bear to bedtime bear. <laughs> and he was no stranger to political unrest either. His older brother was executed for plotting to kill the Tsar, and Lenin himself was expelled from university for participating in a student protest. But how did Lenin go from being a middle class nerd to the arbiter of socialist divinity? Well, to tell that story, time. we first need to go back a few decades to when a man named Karl Marx wrote a manifesto explaining how capitalism is a system whereby the stinky bourgeoisie... Yeah, so what's interesting too is that, notice they said the Communist Manifesto. So the Communist Manifesto was really just a short, it was sort of a introduction to communism really. And it's interesting that that's become the most famous book because I think it's only like 80, 80 pages, 100 pages or so, or so. And it was really just written as an introduction, but Marx is more theoretical work and what people that are interested in Marx would read would be Das Kapital as well as, um, as well as some of his other works too that were more got into the actual critique. But it seems that the Communist Manifesto is always the one that gets the most attention, the one that everyone talks about and is, is the banned book list and everything like that. But you'd have to read Das Kapital to actually see, you know, the actual, um, the actual ideas that, that Marx had written about in more depth and detail uh, as well as Engels too. The oppressed and exploited the working masses and that only through class warfare could the workers rise up and instate a communist utopia. Now go back forward a few decades to Lenin reading that manifesto and loving it. Yeah, so same thing. So Lenin probably would have read, and again, I don't know, but I'm just assuming that Lenin probably would have read more of uh, Marx's actual works and not just the 100 page sort of introduction. But publicly admitting you loved Marx and not Russia's big daddy would get you the cruelest punishment imaginable. Exile to Siberia. Enjoy exile where you'll This is a very long-running theme, by the way. secretly write socialist newspapers. Hey, that doesn't sound so bad. And your mother-in-law is going to live with you. No! Once Lenin finished his stint in Siberia, he left Russia for Europe, where he was free to hang out with other Russian Marxists and talk about how great communism was. Now today, you might hear the word communism and think of this. <laughs> but that's not how intellectuals living under a tough yeah. Tsarist regime saw it. 
To them, communism promised a land where all were equal, where workers weren't exploited, and even people like you could get a girlfriend. So Lenin joined a party of Russian communists living in Europe, and he founded a communist newsletter that was smuggled into Russia to try to radicalize the people. However, not everyone in the Socialist Party agreed with Lenin. In fact, mm, they yes, disagreed very true. on a lot of issues, and Lenin was so uncompromising that he caused a split in the party. Yeah, and so Lenin was really one of the most radical members, too. He really advocated for a violent uprising, right? So rather than reforms or any sorts of things like this, um, even an, an overthrowing of the Tsar peacefully in whatever manner, this was not what went, Lenin had wanted. He wanted that violent revolution. He really, really pushed hard for it. And so the Bolsheviks um, and, and, and the Mensheviks overall, right, the... When, when the Russian Civil War eventually happened, right, if the Bolsheviks had have lost and we had have gotten maybe a more, yes, more socialist, but not in the same vein of, of hard communism. And again, I know people debate these terms all the time, but let's just keep it simple here. Um, what might have happened with Russia if they had have become maybe a social democratic country or something more along these lines? During one conference, a heated debate broke out and Lenin was unwilling to give an inch. You pig ignorant! half-witted, fatuous morons! Cereal is a soup! Listen, Lenin, you're a smart guy, but you have no idea what you're talking about. We're out of here. All in favor of cereal being a soup? <laughs> hey, would you look at that? We're in the majority. So Lenin set up his own faction within the party he called the majority, or Bolshevik if you're speaking Russian. And the other faction became known as the minority, or Menshevik. And oddly, the majority were often in the minority, and the minority in the majority. The Mensheviks were less radical, whereas Lenin wanted the Bolsheviks to be loyal to him and his uncompromising ideas. And if you weren't loyal, well then you're gonna get a big brain beatdown. Hmm. Mensheviks worried that Lenin's attitude could lead to a one-man dictatorship. But come on, does this guy look like a dictator to you? For now, Lenin remained in Europe, writing his socialist newspaper and impatiently awaiting an opportunity to overthrow the Tsar and bring communist utopia to Russia. Cool, a free hat. Who the heck are you? I'm definitely not a Russian secret police officer spying on Marxists. Oh crap, I don't want secret police watching me. Then you, my friend, should use NordVPN. Do you- Nice, of course. All right, I'm just gonna skip through it. So if you don't know what NordVPN is, petit I don't know. Now, but, where was I? Yeah. Oh yeah, a timid, easily swayed czar, a massive ill-tempered jerk, impatiently awaiting a communist revolution. And revolution was coming, but not in the way Lenin thought. Back in St. Petersburg, one of the Tsar's most skilled and influential advisors knew the country finally needed to catch up with the rest of Europe. Hey Nick, we really got to industrialize, get more factories, and make some, I don't know, textiles or something. Hmm, won't that change the social fabric of Russia? Maybe. Hey, isn't it past your bedtime? But I haven't had my milk and snuggles yet. Will you snuggle me? Um, Nicholas thought modernization <laughs> was boring, but he let Sergei do his thing. And do his thing he did. He borrowed some money and got Russia some sexy factories. And you know what sexy factories means. Sexy workers. Dirt poor sexy workers. Mm. Long hours. Low wages. Filthy disease ridden factories. Sleep in overcrowded dormitories with all your stinky worker friends. Get your arms ripped off in a freak Russian doll accident. Conditions were terrible. But this growing working class wasn't about to take it lying down. They started to do what workers do best. Yeah, and so things like the eight hour workday is something that I, I guess, you know, a lot of people now at this point sort of take for granted but at this point you had 12 16 hour long days work living where you worked and it was just truly truly awful conditions as well as i think at this point child labor is still legal right where within you know a few lifetimes child labor in much of the western world and um and i mean the world as a majority is legal at this point strike Despite Sergei's efforts, people in Russia still weren't happy. Peasants were still poor, liberals still wanted reform, and now the workers wanted better working conditions. And mm -hmm. the problem with being an autocrat is that when everyone's unhappy, there's only one person to blame. You. You. The yep. people hate me. What do I do? Ooh, I know. Why don't we find a weak and pathetic nation to go to war with? We'll win easily, and everyone will love me again. Why don't we just try treating the people better? <laughs> As luck would have it, an opportunity for war was forming in the Far East. Russia wanted to expand its sphere of influence ah, into yes. northern China, and coincidentally, so did Japan. But Japan didn't really want war, so they proposed an idea to reduce the tension. Hey man, we'll let you do your thing in Manchuria if you let us do our thing in Korea. Uh, I don't think so. We've got the largest army in the world. What do you have? I'm the Emperor of Japan. 
I have a giant mecha suit. Whoa. Cool. Nicholas and the boys didn't see Japan as a threat, so they felt they could push Japan around. But little did they know, Japan had been rapidly militarizing, and when they launched a surprise attack on a Russian fleet at Port Arthur, everyone was shocked. Nicholas hoped it was an opportunity to win a quick war and regain the support of the people. Nobody seriously thought a puny Asian country could defeat a European superpower, and the Russian people were filled with patriotic spunk. Hey everyone, we're at war with Japan! Yeah, it doesn't go well. Hey everyone, we're losing the war. The Japanese <laughs> won, an embarrassing yeah. defeat for Tsar Nicholas. Russia had enough problems, but now it had been internationally humiliated. The public were outraged. Unrest increased. Nicholas needed snuggles now more than ever. The tension was rising rapidly, and Russia was on the verge of revolution. All it needed was one disaster to push it over the edge. And that disaster would come in January 1905 from an unlikely source, a handsome Orthodox priest named Father Gapon. Yes. Father Gapon was leading workers and their families to the Winter Palace. But this wasn't some violent uprising. It was a peaceful protest. They wanted to deliver a petition to Nicholas, which simply asked for more freedom and better working conditions. The protest was actually so peaceful and respectful that the Marxists thought it was a big waste of time. Hey Nicholas, some priest is leading a peaceful protest. Says here they want to give you a petition. A peaceful petitioning priest? I better get out of here. Nicholas had actually left the Winter Palace days earlier, and in his place, they brought in a truckload of troops, ordered to stop Father Gapon from reaching the palace. Hello, good sir, and long live the Tsar. Please, allow me to pass this simple petition to our dear father, Nicholas II. Nope. Good day to you too. Please, allow us to respond by opening fire. Yeah, tragedy. What began as a peaceful protest ended in tragedy. Imperial soldiers opened fire on the crowd. Around 200 civilians died, 800 more were wounded. All they wanted was the opportunity to ask Nicholas to improve their lives. Instead, they were met with bullets. Nicholas didn't personally order the troops to fire, but as an autocrat, he got the blame. The of event course. became known as Bloody Sunday, and Nicholas's reputation plummeted. Strikes erupt. How many Bloody Sundays are there? I, I can think of four off the top of my head, most of them being in Ireland, but like how, how many are there? Like if you just Google Bloody Sunday, how many different historical events are you going to get? And why does it always take place on a Sunday? Anyways, I've never heard of a Bloody Tuesday. Anyways. Did across the empire, workers' demands increased. Liberals demanded political power. Peasants demanded land. The country was out of control. And the 1905 revolution had begun. Yep. Listen, Nicholas. Peasants seizing my land and murdering my family I can tolerate. But illegally chopping my wood? That's obscene. And the worse I treat my workers, the more they strike. I don't get it. Everyone relax. As long as the military is still on my side, there's nothing to worry about. Sir, the sailors are starting to mutiny. Well, yep. my life just sucks. With Russia still losing to the Japanese, unrest was growing in the military, and some sailors had even taken to killing officers. Having the people against you was bad enough, but if the military joined in, it would be game over. To make matters worse, in October, workers and Marxists, including one Leon Trotsky, began setting up local elected councils called Soviets that coordinated strikes and supplied the workers. Sergei could see the writing on the wall. Things were going south fast, and he needed a big idea to save the Tsar. And luckily, he had just that. You see, all these angry people from different parts of society weren't really working together, meaning there was a weakness mm, to exploit. True. Sergei wrote a manifesto that would give the liberals an elected assembly called the Duma. It took some convincing, but eventually, Nicholas agreed to share power and have his laws approved by an elected assembly. Hey, liberals, here's your stupid manifesto. Happy now? We certainly are. But what about these guys? Aren't you going to give them what they want? Oh, goodness, no. I was just going to kill them. With the liberals satisfied, and after ending the war with Japan, the Tsar brought thousands of troops home, who then dismantled the Soviets, arrested their leaders, and crushed the peasant uprisings in the countryside. And how about that pesky parliament Nicholas had agreed to share power with? Well, he then wrote a bunch of new laws, which basically said, Hey, remember that manifesto I wrote and how you guys were going to approve my laws? Mm-hmm. Slight change of plan. Yeah. Actually, no. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want, and you guys are going to shut up. What? The people won't stand for this. People? What people? You know, this is why people don't like you. And just like that, yeah. Nicholas had survived the 1905 revolution. But wait, a revolution? In Russia? Where was Lenin? Yeah, and so basically the Duma was, it was basically a phony court. It was supposed to be a constitutional monarchy in the vein of sort of Britain, although the, the Tsar would have more power um, than, the, than the king at this time. But ultimately it was basically just political theater. And the Tsar Nicholas II had 
control over every single thing. So all decisions needed to eventually be approved or disproved uh, by them, by him, sorry. And yeah, it was still more of the same, but it looked on the surface like it was a reform. In reality, though, it wasn't at all. Well, Lenin and his communist pals were still in exile. He tried desperately to radicalize the uprising, but all he could do was watch. As the movements failed to organize, the liberals sold out the poor, and the Tsarat played the people. Furious, he believed Russia had missed a great chance for a real revolution. From now on, he felt the only way left was an armed revolution yeah. by the workers. Watching the events of 1905 unfold, Lenin learned a lot. The Tsar, however, would prove to have learned nothing. <laughs> After the 1905 revolution had failed, the Tsar's new top man was Pyotr Stolopin, and he had big ideas to prevent any more chaos. Step one, reform agriculture. This'll make the peasants love you. And step two, uh, we'll kill anyone who doesn't. To discourage any more revolutionary ideas, Stolopin began to crack down even harder on the Tsar's opponents, and thousands were sentenced to death. The noose even earned itself a new nickname, Stolopin's necktie. Yep. And so you see this a lot in reoccurring um, reoccurring countries in, in throughout history is that you try to get these reforms, they're crushed, and then the repression is even harder than it was before to really try and crack down on those elements. And whether in the case of Russia, you'll get a second revolution, in this case, 12 years later, or if that just doesn't come and then the repression is just brutalized, right, and is made even worse. And so, hey, kudos to the people with nerves of steel that are fighting for democratic or, or, or liberal reforms for their country because yeah sometimes the alternative when those fail are much worse than it was before i don't get it oh i see because it goes around my neck <laughs> that's so funny but despite the oppression many positive reforms were also being made and the russian economy even began to improve this was a problem for lenin if the people weren't suffering then they wouldn't support a revolution Still in exile and lacking funds, the Bolsheviks simply weren't in a position to do anything. Luckily, it was around this time that Lenin met an incredibly handsome Georgian with your second favorite historical mustache, Joseph Stalin. Lenin and Stalin met at a communist convention in Finland, and Lenin liked Stalin because he was a real go-getter and was great at fundraising for the Bolsheviks. And by fundraising, I mean kidnapping, robbing, extorting, bribing, ransoming, assassinating, prison breaking, stealing, bank raiding, executioning, and stealing yep. again. Hey Stalin, the Mensheviks aren't so hot in all this stealing, but we still need money. So the next time you do a big heist, just do it quietly. Okay, quietly. Got it. If this isn't quiet, I don't know what is. Stalin's wacky antics eventually got him exiled to Siberia, but he had established himself as a big balls Bolshevik. However, no amount of Bolshevik balls could stop what was happening. The Russian economy was making a recovery. For the Tsar, things were looking up. This is great. All Nicholas has to do is sit back and not mess anything up. Hey everyone, big news. I'd like to introduce you to my new best friend. He's a crazy, drunken, beardy, horny, scandal-ridden oh. magic wizard man, <laughs> and he smells like a goat. Yep. We're screwed. Rasputin. A dirt poor peasant from dirt poor nowhere. But unlike all the other dirt poor peasants, Rasputin had holy healing powers. And when this holy mystic wandered into St. Petersburg, people began to notice. He quickly became famous, and word of this mystery man in his healing hands made its way to the royal palace. The appearance of a holy homeless healer was of great interest to the Tsar and his wife. As far as royals go, they weren't that inbred, but they were just inbred enough for their son Alexei to get hemophilia, or in layman's terms, Mamma mia, that's a lot of blood. Knowing Rasputin could heal people, Horrible in 1906, disease. Alexandra asked for Rasputin to come and see if he could cure their son. And crazy as it sounds, Rasputin did heal Alexei, possibly by taking him off his doctor-prescribed aspirin. Having seemingly done the impossible, Rasputin became very, very close to the royal family. But having a crazy homeless wizard man hanging around wasn't a good look for the Tsar, <laughs> because Rasputin was freaky. Not only was he a big fan of alcohol, but he'd also throw these crazy parties with Russian nobility where he'd and all night long and then yep. he'd his whole head if not a guy's and nobody knew how the goat got on the roof. <laughs> Initially, the press were banned from talking about Rasputin, but eventually the ban was lifted and the tabloids went to town. The whole thing was a huge scandal and everyone was freaked out that this guy was influencing the Tsar and his wife. Nicholas could have spent this period of relative peace improving his image. Instead, he spent it doing this. But as weird as the whole Rasputin thing was, so long as the economy continued to improve and the people's lives kept getting better, maybe Nick would be okay. Maybe there would be no more revolutions. Maybe this video could even end right here. Or maybe things were about to get worse. A lot oh, yeah. worse. You see, the year is 1914. 
And that means it's time World for World War One. War One. Yep. Cool. All right. So the next video we'll get into World War One and the eventual collapse of the Russian state, which would ultimately end in the Soviet Union being formed after the Russian Civil War, which took place as well. Thank you all very much for joining me. Another great video from Oversimplified. All of us really are. So yeah, hope you learned something. I always learn something from his videos. They're great. And uh, yeah, see you in part two. Hopefully you'll join me. Until then, take care. See you guys in the next video.